All right, Dr. Baker here. Let's talk a little bit about blood glucose. And we see some people that have been monitoring the blood sugar and occasionally see their blood glucose go over 200. They will then hypothesize that spikes over 200 are signs of, of something that's wrong, an allergy perhaps, or obviously diabetes or some reaction to the food. Is that true? Is there anything uh, to be said around that? Is being over 200 occasionally okay? Or is there something more going on in the surface? So in this video, we're going to talk about uh, some of the details of blood glucose monitoring, talk a little bit about CGMs, which are kind of a new thing. And we'll look at some of the research on what it says about having these high spikes. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it okay in certain situations? And so let's talk about what is blood glucose. Well, blood glucose is a measure of the amount of circulating glucose that's in your blood at any given moment. We need blood glucose for many tissues in our body to include our brain, our parts of our kidney, our testicles, our red blood cells, and a few other cells are very much, very much dependent upon glucose. There is uh, uh, some average measures that people seem to, to do best in. Uh, we want some glucose to sustain our energy throughout the day. It should never be zero. And in fact, even the people that don't eat any carbohydrates rarely will see a very low blood glucose is because our body is so affected at keeping our blood glucose you know, at a minimal level so that we can continue to fuel those uh, very critical uh, parts of our body. Too much circulating glucose may mean that insulin is not doing the job to clear glucose very well, and so that can be a, a problem. High fasting or postprandial glucose is often considered a marker of insulin resistance. Traditionally, there are three ways that we often measure uh, blood glucose. One is a kind of a chronic lab called the hemoglobin A1C, and it measures sort of the average blood glucose over a period of three months or 90 days. Now there's some problems with that number depending upon how long your red cells live. Some people whose red cells live a little bit longer may have falsely elevated hemoglobin A1Cs. And conversely, people whose red cells die very early may have falsely low levels of hemoglobin A1C. So there is some problems with that value. Uh, often a blood glucose drawn, uh, sometimes done postprandially or after eating, uh, anywhere up to often two hours is often an indicator of how well your body is secreting and then utilizing insulin. And then of course, a fasting blood glucose, which indicates how much uh, glucose is in your body, essentially in a non-digestive state or a resting state. Now, there's some caveats to that, and I think a lot of people uh, run into issues uh, when they don't fast long enough. And I think what I've seen is people that eat large animal-based diets, like a big old steak, you know, the evening, and then they only fast for 10, 12 hours. That's probably not long enough to get a true fasting uh, blood glucose. For those carnivores out there, I would recommend you probably want to spend 18 hours or so fasting to get a true uh, fasting blood glucose. So just, just to uh, put that out there. Now, here's some numbers from the American Diabetes Association. So the typical uh, adult healthy range is between 70 and 140. That's where blood glucose should be the vast majority of the time. A fasting blood glucose should be un one under 100 milligrams per deciliter. And then your two, and two uh, hour postprandial number should typically be, be uh, below 140. Now, 140 to 200 postprandially is considered prediabetes. A fasting number between 100 and 126, also considered prediabetic. And numbers above that, uh, fasting above 126 or uh, postprandial above 200 are considered consistent with diabetes, particularly if you get more than one reading uh, that shows that. Likewise, a hemoglobin A1C above 6.5 is considered diabetic, and then above 5.7 is considered pre-diabetic. And so uh, this is something that can pro provide you some information. So there's several ways to measure it. You know, obviously you can get the, the, the lab test where your doctor orders it. There are home uh, blood glucose monitors, which are often pretty inexpensive, usually they're around 20, 30 bucks. The strips can be a little bit expensive though, but you can certainly prick your finger and get that. And then the latest things are these so-called CGMs or continuous glucose monitors. Now, traditionally those have been reserved for uh, prescription only from doctors, usually to treat diabetics, particularly type one diabetics, but that has been opened up and there are several private companies now that offer uh, CGMs to the general public uh, for a subscription fee. And these things are, you know, they're not, they're not super cheap. You know, you, typically you're going to spend anywhere between 100 and 200 bucks a month on these monitors. So they're not uh, something that is, you know, particularly economical for a lot of people, but it can be very helpful and it can show you a lot of things if you, if you want to sort th some things out. It can teach you what happens to your blood glucose with certain meals, what happens with exercise, with stress, with high intense exercise, with moderate exercise, uh, what's happening when you're sleeping how your meal timing affects it. So it can be very helpful for those people that want to sort of dial in their blood glucose. Now, whether or not that makes a difference or not uh, in, in the long term is yet to be determined, but there's some pretty good evidence that it probably does. You know, what, what about the research over blood glucose over 200? So there has been some now CGM studies looking at uh, 
non-diabetic individuals and they saw that, uh, you know, for the most part, healthy individuals kept their blood glucose between 70 and 140, rarely had spikes and higher than that. And, and then a few individuals they saw above 200, but this was seen, this, this particular group was, was older and, and had some obesity. So probably there was some underlying insulin resistance or uh, glucose dysregulation going on. And so another study looking at young, healthy, lean participants showed that 99.2% of the time the blood glucose was below that 140 milligrams per deciliter mark. So that seems to be a, a fairly important number there. And there's other research done by the uh, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation found that circulating blood glucose above 140 is highly, highly uncommon in healthy non-diabetic individuals. So if you see numbers above 140, I would definitely go get things checked out, okay? And even more research indicates that healthy individuals will stay below 140 most of the time and having a reading above 200 ever is an initial indication of metabolic damage, insulin resistance, or poor glucose management. Now, there are some caveats to, to this. Now, if you are on a low carb diet and then you suddenly take in a whole large amount of glucose, you can expect a very high glucose reading. That may not reflect chronic underlying metabolic damage. That's just a condition of not being used to processing glucose. And a lot of people, after a few days or a week of reintroducing carbohydrates, that, that effect normally uh, settles back down. So you need to, that, that's the one ca caveat there. And again, pregnant women on low carb diets, carnivore diets, ketogenic diets, often will have a misdiagnosis of uh, gestational diabetes based on an oral glucose tolerance test. And a lot of obstetricians will alight or a CGM instead. And so. Uh, so there's some nuance to this stuff, um, but in the normal, you know, the normal state, you should not see blood glucose is very high, particularly over 200 and, and rarely over 140. Hopefully that uh, d doesn't create more questions than it answers. Uh, anyway, more to come on this sort of stuff. You guys take care. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the uh, notification bell, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.